Good morning and welcome. What an honor to be asked to speak with you and to launch this critically important conference, the SHARE Conference to End Health Disparities. I was especially excited when asked to speak on the topic of whiteness and how this plays out in healthcare. Over my time doing racial justice trainings for healthcare providers, I have come to learn that whiteness is where we tend to get stuck. It truly is the biggest barrier to moving toward real health equity. My colleagues, myself included, can understand race as socially constructed. We can understand how race is an independent factor in health disparities. And we can also understand racism as a systemic and structural issue, not an interpersonal one. However, white people, especially like myself, tend to get stuck at whiteness, mostly because we don't even understand that this is a thing. Uh, as you know, my name is Steven Nelson, and I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist. I've had the honor of helping take care of children and their families affected by sickle cell disease for three decades. And I didn't know I was white until about 12 years ago. I was floating along thinking I was delivering quality care until I stumbled into a talk given by my current collaborator, Dr. Heather Hackman. Dr. Hackman has been doing racial justice training for educators for over 25 years. And as I'm learning, there are many similarities between our educational system and our healthcare system. Whiteness predominates both. There is the whiteness of the teachers, the whiteness of the curriculum. What history are we taught? What are we not taught? And there's the whiteness of the outcome measures, such as the SAT and the ACT and other uh, achievement tests. Dr. Hagman was giving a 90 minute presentation on white privilege. And I sat in there at age 48, embarrassed, because I've never thought about this issue. And this is because I've never had to think about this issue, because I am a white man in the United States of America. And within healthcare, I'm a physician, which brings with it quite a bit of power. So a, a lot of what we're talking about is about power and oppression. These systems of power and oppression transcend race and can affect our patients from all marginalized groups. However, my focus of work has been around race. And this is because I have spent my career caring for patients with sickle cell disease. For those of you who don't know, sickle cell disease is an inherited disorder of the red blood cell, and it's a global disorder. It affects people of all races. However, in the United States, virtually all the patients are black. And this is a direct result of the Atlantic slave trade starting in 1619. And as I was continuing to sit in Dr. Hackman's session about white privilege, I started thinking about my patients and families. All of my patients and families have different stories, as all of us do. All of you and your families have different stories. However, all of my patients have one thing in common. Not a single one of them is white. And at that point, our entire healthcare team was white. So then I started to wonder, could that fact alone affect the outcomes of our patients? So we asked the question, it matters. It matters a lot. And this was a career defining moment for me and it really stimulated my work to decrease health disparities, especially in our kids with sickle cell disease. Now these disparities as I'm learning are mostly because of whiteness. By definition, whiteness is the combination of white privilege and white supremacy. Whiteness takes many forms within healthcare. For one, there's the demographics of the healthcare team. Uh, these are overwhelmingly white. Only 4% of licensed physicians in the United States are black. In Minnesota, less than 2% of registered nurses are black, brown, or Native American. So why would this be important? Well, we know that patients have better outcomes when there is stronger trust between patient and healthcare provider. When there is trust, there's a greater likelihood that the patient will follow through with the recommended medical plan. And when this happens, there's better outcomes. We also know that when there's racial or cultural concordance between patient and provider, trust building is stronger and easier. Now, given the demographics of our current healthcare teams, this is not an option for the vast majority of Americans of color seeking quality healthcare. And it's not just the racial makeup and demographics of healthcare providers. Another facet of whiteness is white normativity. White is just considered normal especially within healthcare. White is always the reference group when comparing outcomes. I spend much of my day looking up normal hematology values for children, and these are based on 250 kids from Helsinki, Finland, or 1,100 kids from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. 
We pediatricians live and die by the growth chart, which until recently was represented by full-term white formula-fed babies from southeastern Ohio. You get the point. Normal reference ranges are typically derived from white people. And in situations where there is data by race and normals, such as pulmonary function tests, instead of us investigating why black Americans would have poorer lung function compared to white Americans, we'll just make those values normal for black people. There's a great book that I always like to recommend called Breathing Race into the Machine. It describes the history of this particular issue with pulmonary function testing, and it's a great resource for understanding how white normativity plays out in medicine. You know, even how we talk about this can reinforce whiteness, and I do it all the time. Very often in medical literature, and when you're starting to read and, and listen to data, results in data are broken down by race. When they're broken down, the, the table typically has two columns. There's white and non-white. And this tends to reinforce the narrative that white is normal and everybody else isn't. Words matter. So what can we do about it? My organization, Children's Minnesota, is striving to make some real changes. They had been doing an excellent job of hiring more nurses of color, but these nurses weren't staying. They weren't staying because we hadn't done anything to change the culture of our organization the overwhelming whiteness of the organization. Now, we have a chief equity and inclusion officer and a health equity council. Now, all departments, when they report to our board quality committee, need to present their data by race and come up with plans to decrease racial health disparities. This is monitored by our new health equity index. Our organization has done a good job at making equity an important initiative and folding it into uh, 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 current initiatives. Most organizations can get behind quality and safety initiatives. And let's be clear that an equity climate is a quality climate. An equity climate is a safety climate. This isn't extra work. This is just folding it into what you're already doing. Our organization, as with many, have safety learning reports, which is a way that medical mistakes or near misses can be reported, reviewed, and hopefully prevented. We now also have equity learning reports where any staff member, patient, or family member can report incidents of racism and discrimination. These are reviewed by our Health Equity Council. Um, this council is also reviewing every single hospital policy with a critical race lens to ensure equity. And I would have to say one of the biggest improvements in outcomes has come from our hiring a sickle cell family health equity advocate. We hired an African-American woman from the community whose adult son has sickle cell disease. And she can build trust with patients within minutes that might take me hours, days, years, or never. We are hoping to expand these equity advocates to other parts of the hospital, such as our teen diabetes clinic. And finally, on an individual level, we can start to understand how whiteness and the racial narratives that wash over all of us affect our cognition and clinical decision-making at the bedside. We can start to recognize this implicit bias and move towards consciously changing this. This is not easy. This is hard work. And it is essential if we really want good outcomes for all of our patients. So these are but a few examples of what you and your organizations can do. And as you attend the conference over these next two days and you start to hear about these issues and see the data on health disparities, think about these and evaluate these within this framework of whiteness. Whiteness needs to be dismantled before we realize tangible gains. The first step is realizing that it's an issue. It's like fish in the water. Sometimes I don't even see it. And there are still many times when people need to remind me and point out the water. So especially my white colleagues, start seeing the water. And when you do, try not to feel guilt and shame, but feel curious. Why are the things the way they are? I wanna end by saying this is hopeful work. I am proud to be part of this work. Things can get better. Things must get better. Things will get better. I wish you a great conference and thank you.